I majored in um, some uh, completely unrelated area when I was at MIT uh, that had nothing to do with computers and was pretty miserable in that area for my first couple years after I graduated. And um, one of the people I was rooming with was Mike, who's one of our three founders for Bafo. And um, he was Infocom's tester at that point. Infocom didn't even have an office yet. He was testing out of our living room. And then he went off to business school. And uh, Mark Blank, who was the head of development at Infocom, said, I need another tester. Would you be interested? And I said, you know, yes. And I did that for about a year. And then he said, you know, how would you like to try writing a game? And I said, sure. And spent another year doing that, and that was Planetfall. You know, it was something that you know a few people had mentioned. You know, that was really good, but uh, you know, I hadn't actually read it myself. And then as people began playing Planetfall, they they said, you know, this reminds me a lot of Hitchhikers. You really ought to go and read it. And so it was some point, you know, between when testing began on Planetfall and when the product actually shipped, that I went off and I read Hitchhikers, and of course I loved it. And, uh, and I did put in a little reference to it in the, the very beginning of Planetfall. There's an escape pod, and you land on the planet, and uh, uh, after the crash, a, a panel pops open, and there's a, a, a medical kit, and a food kit, and a towel. And, um, and if you look at the towel, it says uh, escape pod number 42. Well, I, I would certainly say that, that nothing about being a game designer, or particularly being a humorous game designer, had anything to do with my earlier career in construction project management. Um, if, if anything, I, I would say that I have retained my humor despite <laughs> that, that career, since uh, essentially there's nothing about that business that um, you know, would, would in fact uh, foster creativity or humor, and in fact uh, many things about it that would you know, wring it out of you given <laughs> any opportunity in any length of time. Uh, you know, when I, was, when I was a kid, I never really perceived myself, or I don't think I was perceived by others as being particularly funny. Um, and in fact, you know, when I, when I started writing Planetfall, I was not intending to write a comedy adventure game. I was just, you know, intending to write an adventure game, and it was really only after people started playing it, they started saying, hey, this is, you know, a lot funnier than any adventure game I've ever played. When Monty Python's Flying Circus came out, I was a big fan of that. Um, so that would have been like the early 70s during my, my uh, high school years. And um, I, I don't know, like I'd say another uh, comic influence was uh, Woody Allen. Uh, so I was a big fan of his. Um, Saturday Night Live. Um, nothing too unusual or out of the mainstream. No, most not entirely. Uh, the, the most serious game I did for Infocom was one called A Mind Forever Voyaging. Uh, so it was quite, quite a different product, and it was very, very much oriented toward story and, and not as much toward puzzles the way traditional adventure games are. And in general, it was not well received by the hardcore Infocom audience, you know, who wanted something, you know, more like, you know, a Zork or a Planetfall. Uh, and it was quite against their expectations. I was there for about seven years because, you know, the character of Floyd came out so well and, you know, and, and is so beloved by, by people even to this day. People, you know, come to me and, you know, talk about how it was, you know, one of the greatest experiences, you know, ever playing a computer game for them. Converting, you know, something from another medium to an adventure game was, you know, very different. Working, uh, you know, with a, another author in a collaboration was, was really the only time I've done that. It was, for, for one thing, it was the first time that I'd worked with graphics after, you know, the six games before that being all text adventures. And for the first time I was working, you know, graphically and obviously that adds a whole another dimension. You know, Zork Zero was probably three or four times as big as any of the other games that I did at Infocom. And uh, just the scope of the game was at, at times just staggering. So there were just so many fun things we did with that, you know, just in addition to sort of the risque element. Um, we had the, the 3D comic book in the package, and that was, you know, that was a lot of fun writing that and working on that. And, um, and the scratch and sniff card uh, was, was probably, you know, putting that together was probably one of the most fun things I ever did at Infocom. It was very much a one-person operation. I mean, I would go off by myself, you know, almost, you know, literally behind a locked door for, you know, four months or five months or six months and, you know, just write and, you know, program and then, you know, finally kind of produce a testing-ready product. Um, and uh, I had, you know, almost like complete control over every aspect of the game and, you know, every, you know, you know, pixel and every, you know, 
bit and everything was like totally under my control. Nowadays, um, you know, there's just a, such a collaborative effort with, you know, whole teams of people working on art and music and sound and, you know, programming staffs of half a dozen and stuff like that. It's become, you know, a completely different process and, you know, it's no longer possible for one person to micromanage everything the way I was able to do in the early days. For the legend style of games, I'd, I'd say there's still, you know, about the same amount of writing. Um, for something like Planetfall, for a system like that, where, you know, all the dialogue is going to be filmed, you know, there's definitely by, you know, uh, you know, by the laws of you know how much space that that, that takes up, there's you know definitely not going to be as much space for you know for dialogue, and you know the writing is you know very minimized in that system. Um, you know, I, I think you could you could almost take any game design that I did you know back in the, as a text adventure and adapt it you know to that same system with you know not very significant changes. Infocom's sort of philosophy with text adventures was extreme portability. Um, you know, there was the game, and then there was the interpreter, and, you know, there's an interpreter for every machine, and, and as soon as a game was written, you know, the interpreter would make it run on, on every machine, so you sort of had instant portability. I didn't know EGA from a hole in the ground, and, um, you know, sort of having to, to learn everything about graphics almost from scratch uh, was a big learning curve. Um, but just from, you know, sort of from a design standpoint, um, I didn't find it to be that big a deal. Uh, because, as I said, the underlying game was really the same. A lot of people have been calling it Planetfall 2, which is a little weird because I also wrote Stationfall, which was the sequel to Planetfall, so I think of this game more as Planetfall 3 <laughs> It's Planetfall 2. Um, for a while it was also called The, uh, the Search for Floyd. Um, I, I don't suspect that any of the names that anyone has heard so far is going to be what it's actually released under, except it'll certainly have Planetfall in the title somewhere. <laughs> and what we eventually settled on was that the game would take place, you know, significantly further in the future than Stationfall. You wouldn't play the same character. Uh, however, it would be set on the same ship, <coughs> the same spaceship that Stationfall was set on. Um, and you would find the effects of, you know, the player that you played in Planetfall and Stationfall, who of course is long dead, and among his effects, you know, would be, um, you know, sort of the, the, the few remaining parts of Floyd after his destruction. One of the things in the hold of the ship is this strange alien device, you know, that was discovered and no one really knows what it does. It turns out it's a robot recreator that can you know, recreate robots from, you know, you know, uh, you know, pieces of, of robots. and and therefore you take these, you know, last remaining effects and find the pieces of Floyd and put them in this robot recreator and it recreates Floyd. As you can imagine, um, uh, reaction was fairly passionate on both sides. I'd say the majority of people, you know, very unhappy that they had to do that. You know, a smaller number of people, you know, just like really excited about how different it was and, you know, that they really were, you know, sort of faced with this sort of decision that, you know, they were not used to, you know, being faced with just in a computer game. As I pointed out to people who complained, you know, really the choice was theirs. You know, if, if they would prefer to let Floyd live and see the pyramids launched, you know, they could do that. There's just no doubt that, like, many people are going to see Floyd and they're going to say, no, no, that's not Floyd. <laughs> and, you know, there's just no way around that unless you just sort of throw up your arms and, you know, forget it, we just can't show Floyd, in which case you just can't do this game, you know, as a, as a current, you know, day adventure game. You obviously can't design every single location so the ground isn't exactly the same point in the picture. Um, and therefore, because of that, um, the ultimate decision was that Floyd would be, would be a floating robot with, like, little jets for feet instead of, uh, you know, instead of feet, you know, that would touch the ground, you'd have like little jets and would sort of fly around and float around. And, um, and that's clearly different from the description of Floyd in Planetfall and Stationfall. His face, you know, I was, you know, that was probably where most of the effort went into. And, uh, yeah, it was very, very many rounds of, you know, sort of like, you know, no, you know, he looks too old, he looks too young, he looks too stupid, he looks too intelligent, you know, he looks too cute, not cute enough, too fat, too thin, you know, I mean, just sort of like round after round of, you know, refining him and refining him. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the way he's coming out. Actually, I had, you know, wanted to do it at Infocom um, back toward the last days there. And uh, it, it actually might have been my next project at Infocom had Infocom not gone away. I've been doing, obviously, straight adventures all along. And to be able to do uh, something with role-playing elements as well was a nice change of pace. There's certainly a lot of a lot of differences with that style of game, the multiple parties and combat and, you know, sort of all the character statistics and character ratings and things that go along with role-playing. There's a whole sort of new element of gaming you know, that I hadn't worked 
on from the design side, although I did enjoy playing them from the game playing side. They're not puzzles in the adventure game sense where you sort of solve them and then you know the answer and then, you know, you're sort of done with them. In, in this case, um, you know, they're, they're pretty much replayable games, arcade games and word games and casino games and, and games that really, you know, don't fit into any, you know, sort of quick one-word categories. Um, and in, in almost all cases, they're, you know, games that you can pretty much play over and over again indefinitely. As you're searching for Mission Mosh, the two kidnapped princesses, um, you can you travel around the kingdom of Potpourri, and you come across these various games within the game. You play them, and depending on how well you do in them, that gives you the information and the objects and the money that you need to find the princesses and, and ultimately to rescue them. Podge and Podge can just be used as a big a big game pack, a big sampler of these mini games, you know, which you can play. Uh, apart from within the context of the board game, you can just sort of sit down and say, okay, you know, I want to play Archeroids, and, you know, just sit down and play that for five minutes or ten minutes, rather than, you know, playing the board game, which is, you know, one or two hour, you know, commitment. Like Superhero League of Hoboken, and it's a game design that I've been working on for about five years. Um, it's not quite as old as Superhero League of Hoboken. Uh, I started working on it um, during the summer after Infocom folded. I was, um, I was sort of nostalgic for the very early days of computer gaming, for you know the really simple games that you could just sort of sit down and, in um, you know in a minute, you know kind of understand the rules and be having a lot of fun and you know and and uh, be really into. A collection of mini games just wasn't enough because you really needed something to tie together into one product, and so that was where the idea of this board game, you know, with the sort of the fairy tale storyline came from. They would tie all these together and give you a reason why you were going around and playing these games. As you walk around the Kingdom of Potpourri, there's a voiceover narration that um, essentially discusses little things you see in little episodes um, that occur to Hodge or Podge, the two characters you're controlling, as you walk around. And you know, most of them tend to be kind of amusing and, and give the game a whole another element that it wouldn't have had otherwise. Definitely a lot of ideas that I have that I'd like to do that are, you know, non-comedies, um, but, um, you know, basically uh, the, the stage that Poffo is at right now, we're just a developer and not a publisher, and, you know, all we, can, all we can do right now is something that we can interest a publisher in. And, you know, the best I can do is sort of, you know, pitch them these ideas and say, uh, you know, wouldn't this be cool? But, um, you know, there's no doubt that Mostly when publishers think of me and think of Buffo, they think of, you know, comedy or humorous games. And um, at least, you know, until, until the right publisher comes along or until Buffo is in the position to self-publish, you know, I, I don't think that'll happen in the short term. I like doing comedy. It's, it's probably the favorite thing I like to do, and therefore, you know, it, it's not that awful a fate to be doing it, you know, most of the time. Focom was getting increasingly pigeonholed into, into a, uh, you know, people wanted sort of very hard, you know, very puzzle-oriented um, adventure games, you know, preferably either science fiction or fantasy. And, um, and kind of the more you delivered to that audience, sort of the more rabid they got and the more concentrated it got, and it almost became a trap. And, you know, Infocom went, you know, to very great extremes to try to break out of that.